Hello, welcome. Um, we're happy to have you for our, the next rendition of our Tools of the Trade uh, uh, seminar series. Uh, this one is, as you can tell and know since you registered, uh, focused on rare disease research. Um, we have a pretty packed agenda, so uh, hopefully there'll be a lot uh, that you can sort of take home with you and uh, apply to your, to your own research projects, uh, some tangible things and uh, good, good advice. So we're going to start off with um, uh, conducting rare disease research, addressing ethical and scientific concerns, and sort of an overview uh, of uh, rare disease research and some of the challenges that come along with that. And then we'll go and focus on engaging with rare disease communities and patient populations, um, followed by um, forming collaborations, partnerships, and research networks. Um, and then we will have a researcher speed networking workshop, which we hope uh, you will find uh, useful in, in meeting uh, your peers and maybe uh, get, having an opportunity to find a collaborator and get into some good discussions. Uh, after that, we will have T4 Live, which is, um, T4 is the Translational Therapeutics Think Tank, and that is one of the CCTS provided uh, support uh, resources or services, as you will. It is a panel of experts that you can present any of your barriers or challenges in your research, uh, and they will help discuss and help find ways to overcome those barriers. It's really a valuable uh, resource and opportunity, and uh, it's not just for early, in, early stage investigators. We've had uh, very experienced researchers benefit from it as well, and uh, it's something that I highly recommend. And the way we decided to share that with you today is to take a session that has already occurred, uh, and do a mock session today uh, so that you can see how it works and then we'll have the panel turn around and sort of answer questions either about what was discussed or about uh, T4 uh, resource itself and how you can take advantage of it. So um, with that said, we're going to move on to our first uh, presenter, which is um, Michael Griever. He is the chair of the Department of Internal Medicine and has conducted rare disease research in uh, the one of the most uh, noter, uh, the one of note mostly is hairy cell leukemia and also with uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and if I'm missing one we'll have uh, him share that with you as well so uh, Dr. Reaver Well, thank you for coming. I think this is really important. Uh, it's an important opportunity. Uh, the CTSA has uh, put on a series of these tools of the trade, which have been very uh, well received by a lot of uh, young investigators in training. I think the opportunity to get engaged in uh, rare disease research offers career building opportunities that people might not initially even consider. Uh, but there's <clears throat> plenty of uh, uh, opportunities to help patients and also to help one's own career by engaging uh, in this uh, general area. Back a long time ago, Dr. Harvey stated that uh, nature displays her secret mysteries uh, in leading to discovery by investigating the rarer forms of disease. And what we know is that the more understanding of the basic molecular biology and pathogenesis of rare diseases, enables us to come up with treatment strategies, uh, new drugs and treatment strategies that actually can make an impact on patients, but also can have uh, further benefit for patients with more common diseases. The more we understand about how uh, new drugs or strategies work in a rare disease, there are opportunities there to gain insight into how we can maybe help uh, patients with even more common diseases, and it, and it uh, can go both directions. In 1983, the federal government uh, decided to provide both tax and exclusivity incentives to pharmaceutical companies if they would invest uh, in rare disease research, particularly in the area of therapy. Uh, pharmaceutical firms often make decisions based on the ability to market their, their products because the cost of developing new therapeutic agents is very high and it takes a long time. 
So in order to attract the pharmaceutical industry to invest uh, in rare diseases, they uh, constructed this uh, protection to allow seven years of uh, protected time and tax advantages if a new agent would be available for treating patients with a rare disease. So a rare disease actually in the United States, the definition is less than 200,000 patients. This varies across the globe, but at least in the United States, this really encompasses uh, uh, many different diseases or different categories of disease. And since 1983, this uh, Orphan Disease Drug Act has enabled three, over 300 drugs to be approved specifically for those conditions and that compares to less than 10 that had been approved by the FDA in the decade preceding uh, 1983. The National Center for Advancing Translational Research, or NCATS, which is the mother institution that funds all of the CTSAs, has an office for rare disease uh, research, and they recognize about 7,000 different rare diseases. And if one estimates uh, the number of Americans that suffer from an orphan disease, it gets into the 20 to 30 million uh, range. So looking for effective therapy in a rare disease, it really uh, has been propelled by a better understanding of the molecular biology and the pathogenesis. And if we understand uh, the molecular pathogenesis, this will enable us to identify molecular targets uh, that can be approached. And also uh, will provide information about biomarkers that either predict uh, the outcome of the rare disease uh, or its um, effective interaction with a new agent. As we said before, the process of developing new drugs is extremely expensive and, and time consuming. The Institute of Medicine uh, has indicated that about 40% of ongoing cancer clinical trials are not completed. And so this investment uh, in getting the trials up and going is lost. And when we're talking about a rare disease, the pharmaceutical industry really needs uh, more rapid uh, completion of ongoing clinical trials. Otherwise, they won't invest. So <clears throat> the time and expense uh, involved in developing therapies had been a target of the FDA and they have come in with new accelerated approval processes for promising uh, new drugs, and we've seen quite a few of them over the last couple of years. This is a schematic of uh, uh, molecular pathways that are important in um, a theoretical cancer. And if one understands a pathway that's important uh, to keeping the cancer cell uh, alive, blocking that pathway uh, is is very uh, instructive in terms of uh, the effect on the cancer. The one thing, though, that you can easily appreciate is that there are many different pathways to get around this targeted therapy. And so when we're developing targeted agents, unless we develop a strategic approach to block some of the other pathways, we may initially get a response quickly to be followed by relapse. And so the whole new era of targeted molecular therapy has to take into consideration all these other pathways that may result in, in failure. When we're talking about cancer therapy that's targeted, uh, overall there's a higher response rate than standard agents. The specificity for the target uh, also improves what we call the therapeutic index so that there will be more benefit for the patient with hopefully less side effects. As I said, though, drug resistance can develop by these pathways that can circumvent the inhibition of the target. And you need to define how long the target's going to be inhibited and when it's going to recover, and then plan your therapy based, based on that knowledge. When we're developing targeted agents for uh, a rare disease or for cancer in this particular case, uh, having one agent alone does not uh, uh, preclude looking for other agents that could be used as part of a combination strategy. One of the most exciting new agents that uh, you will hear about later today is the discovery of ibrutinib. Much of that work was done here at Ohio State, and uh, it has really revolutionized the treatment of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. As a single therapy, though, we have seen that there are patients that are starting to break through because they are developing resistance 
based on mutations in the, in the interaction between the drug and its target. So therefore, uh, the investigators in the leukemia program are looking for combination strategies that may prevent that breakthrough. This is true not only in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, but other, other cancers as well, and I'll go into another example a little bit later. So the pharmaceutical sponsors, uh, first of all, they've got to be engaged, and so they have to see that we are going to be effectively getting studies up in an expedient fashion, and when we're dealing with a rare disease, there have, we have to deal with the uh, complicating feature of, of their unavailability for studies. There may be uh, distances, or it may be that they are reluctant uh, to, to sign up, uh, but uh, the pharmaceutical sponsors really will uh, require that they see that we're being um, careful and, and expedient in getting the protocol started. So efficient protocol design and implementation is really important when we're dealing uh, with patient accrual on a study. This is often a specific challenge, though, when you're dealing with a rare disease. Multiple institutions need to collaborate. So whether you're talking about a rare form of leukemia or whether you're talking about doing a study that's based on a specific target, uh, you may need to, you probably will have to collaborate with multiple institutions. Rare disease networks and communities, therefore, become very important uh, in making the patients aware of promising opportunities and encouraging them to participate. Because they may be um, unable to easily get to your center, uh, it's important when you're setting up these networks to try and strategically place them so that patients uh, can have access to the trials in these rare diseases. It also becomes a challenge to monitor the safety of the studies whenever you're dealing with multiple institutions. This is just a schematic picture of all the tasks that are involved in getting a drug from the concept to approval. This usually takes anywhere between uh, four to seven years to get all the way through uh, before you know whether or not you have an agent that's likely to be approved by the FDA. This process is expensive and time consuming, and because the FDA has made some opportunities available for promising drugs to get early approval, uh, this process may be uh, shortened. Uh, and if you take a look at abrutinib, for example, this was really accomplished uh, in probably maybe somewhere in the range of about five years. So this process becomes much more challenging when you're dealing with a rare disease whenever you have fewer patients, fewer patients who might meet the eligibility criteria for a protocol and also separated by distance. This takes teamwork, and when you're looking for new therapies, uh, the, the programs that are most successful really get engaged uh, in testing a hypothesis. Most of the most successful uh, drug development teams don't just view themselves as drug testing units. And one of the advantages of getting engaged with testing hypotheses is you really start to learn more and more about the disease and then you start to appreciate how that might even apply to other more common diseases. Hairy cell leukemia is described here in 1958 uh, by Dr. Bertha Bronkley, and this was a landmark paper where she described all of the clinical manifestations of the disease. We became involved with looking for uh, therapy here uh, <clears throat> back in the 1980s. If you take a look at the red line here, this is just something that I added, because back in 1984, the average survival was only about four and a half years. And so uh, this survival curve has been markedly improved by the introduction of uh, several agents. Uh, one of them was interferon. One, so one of these lines represents patients who were treated with interferon, and the other line represents uh, patients who were treated with an inhibitor of adenosine deaminase, uh, pentastatin. And when patients on one arm of this large study with 350 patients with this rare disease, when one of the arms contained the interferon, if they started to uh, progress or not respond, they would convert over to the other agent. So pentastatin was so effective that it was even able to rescue patients who weren't responding to the first-line therapy. 
But the real purpose of this slide is to show that we've changed the natural history of this rare disease. People now live as long as they would uh, with, without the disease, but they do have other problems. But we've actually changed the natural history of this disease. When I was at the National Cancer Institute, the director of the National Cancer Institute told me that because this was such a rare disease, uh, we didn't change the national picture of dying from cancer. I said, well, I know, but we've made a big impact for patients with hairy cell leukemia. And it's furthermore, we've learned a lot about other diseases because of this, uh, because of this, these investigations. So <clears throat> hairy cell leukemia, uh, but in some uh, uninformed circles, they feel that the problem has been resolved because patients live as long as they would have if they didn't have the leukemia. But the truth is that 40 to 50% of these patients are gonna relapse and require multiple uh, courses of therapy over the remainder of their life uh, so that they will have a near normal lifespan. <clears throat> so in order to look at um, what we might do here, there are several studies that we're doing here uh, at Ohio State, but we're doing them in conjunction with a number of other institutions because hairy cell leukemia is rare. Uh, Dr. Jones is looking at ibrutinib here, and uh, we're about ready to present this uh, results of this study at a meeting coming up next week in Germany. This uh, look at vemurafamib um, was the recent uh, uh, publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, and we'll go into this in just a minute. But we're also moving on to the next step because even patients who are getting responses to these investigational agents particularly vemurafamib, all will relapse. The BRAF mutation was actually described in patients with malignant melanoma. And this mutation was found in patients with widespread uh, metastatic disease with malignant melanoma. And it was felt to be a target. It's a kinase that's responsible for driving the malignant cell. It's found in about 40 to 60% of patients with malignant melanoma. And in, in, in those patients who have this specific mutation, if you treat them with the inhibitor of, of this BRAF mutation, vemurafmib, if you treat them, you'll get responses in about 50% of the patients. But ultimately, they're all going to relapse. And so there's a big uh, push to try and find combination strategies so we can get more prolonged responses in these patients. This is a real breakthrough in solid tumor therapy because malignant melanoma previously was a, a very, had a very grim, dismal prognosis. One of the unusual uh, findings in looking at hairy cell leukemia in 2011, <clears throat> it was described that 90% of patients with hairy cell leukemia have this same mutation. Nobody would have ever thought that there'd be some common uh, mutation between malignant melanoma and hairy cell leukemia. Because of this uh, mutation being present in 90% of the patients with hairy cell leukemia, this drug, vemurafamib, was then tried in patients who um, were failing on the, on, the, on the initial therapy. This slide just shows that <clears throat> hairy cell leukemia may be only 1,000 patients per year but because this particular mutation is found in 90% of the patients, we will be able to learn what other pathways could be blocked. And this may go on to help the 76,000 patients uh, with malignant melanoma if we have a better understanding of the pathways that are responsible for failure to maintain a response. So if we think about this, it was really the description of the underlying molecular pathogenesis of malignant melanoma that identified this target, which has helped patients with melanoma for a short period of time. And now the fact that this is present in 90% of the patients with hairy cell leukemia may enable uh, not only the treatment of hairy cell leukemia in relapse, but also what we learn about hairy cell leukemia may then come back to help patients with malignant melanoma. And one of the other advantages in dealing with hairy cell leukemia is that you can isolate the cells and study them. So you can take the cells from patients who have relapsed and understand what pathways may be upregulated. And if we then learn what targets are available, this may provide uh, inv valuable information for the treatment of patients with melanoma. So this schematic shows the importance of uh, this particular mutation in the, in the, in the pathway. 
that drives this phospho -ERC. And this is what is responsible for um, perpetuating the malignant cell. This shows the results of a patient who had failed to respond to all the standard therapy, and then they got treated with vemurafenib and went into a complete remission. This shows the molecular uh, findings. Uh, these cells over here are all hairy cell leukemia, and over here, uh, the hairy cells are gone, and when this patient relapsed, uh, they were retreated re and responded again. But we need to find out what pathways are important, and this will give us potentially some information about treating uh, melanoma. So the FDA has uh, identified safety and evidence of effectiveness as being absolutely necessary for approving new drugs. They have come up with several new accelerated approval pathways, and if you find a promising drug or find a drug that might work in more than one disease, uh, they're much more willing to consider uh, giving approval for treating more patients in a more expedient fashion. <clears throat> Before approval, all toxicities uh, have to be reported, and when these new drugs are being used in different diseases, uh, it's really important that we also keep uh, the government uh, advised because if you're dealing with a rare disease, by the time uh, it, larger numbers of patients are treated, you may find that there are other less common side effects that need to be considered. There are several different pathways that have been introduced to get access to new drugs in a more expedient fashion. And one of the things that I want to finish up with here is the formation of these international uh, networks when you're dealing with a rare disease will markedly improve your ability to make an impact. In, in 2008, we had 20 center centers of excellence in three continents that agreed to work on hairy cell leukemia research. We developed a website so that patients could uh, get questions uh, answered and also learn more about the disease. We've had eight uh, annual symposia, one at the NIH and another one at the American Society of Hematology. We've set up a uh, peer-reviewed research award process. We've developed collectively a consensus document for treating patients, and Dr. Andritsos, who's in the audience, has established a patient registry across the globe. This is informative and invites patients to uh, submit questions and also helps them identify centers of excellence where research is being conducted. As you can see, we have um, a number of institutions here in the United States and in Europe, Australia, and our, we're getting together in Germany next, uh, next week uh, to discuss our, our, com our uh, collaborative research. Engaging patients themselves in rare disease uh, research is important. They need to trust the investigators, have access to authoritative information, <clears throat> recognizing barriers to participation, distance, eligibility criteria. These are very important when you're dealing with small patient populations. The physicians who are leading these also often uh, serve as experts, not only uh, to share knowledge with the patients, but also with referring physicians. Rare disease communities can help uh, patients who feel isolated uh, to realize that uh, information uh, and access to ex experts will give them more comfort and, and uh, hope. One very uh, quick and final example of how this has helped, here was a 45-year-old woman in Russia with a new diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia. She had respiratory failure. She was on a ventilator <clears throat> with bilateral pneumonia. She had very, very low counts. They were going to put her on a medicine called cladribine, which is usually the standard therapy. <clears throat> because they gained access uh, to knowledge about this uh, hairy cell leukemia foundation, expert colleagues were able to uh, recommend her transfer to a center where they uh, would not use cladribine initially uh, because it would be very myelosuppressive, and instead they used vemurafenib, which enabled quick uh, blood count recovery. Her infection came under control. She came off the ventilator and then was able to achieve a complete remission. And she's coming to join us at this upcoming hairy cell conference in Germany. The other thing I wanted to just point out is that there are research funding opportunities. Um, there's this organization called the National Organization for Rare Disorders, as well as uh, NCATS itself, 
that supports natural history studies and will support studies to improve treatment strategies for patients. The importance of conducting uh, research in rare diseases uh, summarized here, we can gain and share new knowledge for patients and their providers. We can develop new effective treatments, address disease-related complications, and we get this information by having uh, patient registries. This provides patient and family support and overall will improve the health and function of patients afflicted with a rare disease. So I went over, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Griever. Okay, switch back here. Sure. They're normally looking for the study if they know that it exists. So I'm just curious with that particular condition. Well, we've, been able to, uh, we've been able to be very fortunate in expediting several uh, studies in a rare disease. We're, we're conducting this one study here. We, we're the lead on it, ibrutinib and refractory hairy cell leukemia. And we were able to find 35 patients uh, over two years to go on to the study. So the, uh, getting patients in that situation, we, en we enlisted the help of six other centers. Uh, it took us probably, though, close to a year to get the study up and going with all the regulatory requirements. So they each have, um, they each have uh, their unique challenges. Um, the, they're probably equally um, time consuming, but we were able to get the study up and running in about a year and we were able to accrue quite a few patients in two years. Uh, that one study that I mentioned where we compared uh, newly diagnosed patients uh, who needed treatment, where we compared uh, penistatin to interferon, we were able to get 350 patients on that study uh, in three years. That's really, it took a lot of work, but it took every patient in North America who needed to be treated. So we, it really took collaborating with four cooperative groups to get those patients. But we had, um, so having the infrastructure there to uh, get patients registered and, and collaborating with a lot of other institutions is important. That's why I think having these networks is really essential to have it in place. 